Welcome to First United Lutheran Church. This is the message from Sunday. It's our prayer that this message touches your heart and helps to guide you in your life. Let's listen. Today's message, children are important. And this might sound somewhat a little bit like a Mission Sunday message. It's a little bit of that. but um, So, you know, we have Mother's Day, right? That's in May and in Father's Day in June. Do you know when Children's Day is? Every day. Well, it could be. Yeah, especially if you're grandma or grandpa, it's every day. But there is a Children's Day on our calendar. Do we ever celebrate it? You know, in church here, we had a special... Mother's Day message, and we generally have a Father's Day message. But do we have a children's message? Anyone give me the date of Children's Day? June 1. Every year on June 1 is Children's Day. Now, children are important. Our lesson from Deuteronomy this morning says, you know, this lesson is Moses speaking to the people after he came down from God giving him all the instructions. And he says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. So we're being told we are to teach our children. Why would God do that? He does it because children are important. They are the future. You know, the disciples came to Jesus one day and says, Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Calling his, to his side a child, Jesus put the child in the midst of them. He didn't grab Peter. He didn't grab one of the other disciples. He grabbed a child. He says, here's the most important thing in the kingdom of heaven, is the child. We have to remember that. They play a major part of what the future of our church and the future of the world is. Now we as, as adults, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, we have a responsibility here to love, teach, protect, and help win them to Christ. Now this past week, and I've talked to you this, about this before, but this past week I had a great opportunity to be involved with an annual event called uh, Prayer Zone Partners Tour. And it went around the state of Minnesota. This tour was started 10 years ago by a guy by the name of Richard Baker. We've hosted the event here, I think, three, four years back. Richard wanted to combine two of his passions, caring and praying for children and riding motorcycle. So he says, how can I combine them? Well, he combined them by saying, I'm going to get on my motorcycle and ride around the state of Minnesota and pray for children. That first year, two other people said, hey, can I ride with you? And all they basically did was they rode to the four corners of the state of Minnesota, got off their motorcycles, and prayed. Ten years later, this past week, riding in, actually the group from Rosa left on Friday, there was others down in the southern part of the state that worked Friday, but Saturday was the official kickoff day at noon in Hutchinson. Coming in on Saturday was about 85 people on motorcycles. And then there was a couple of us in cars. But we came together in Hutchinson, and all of these people, the group from Rosa we took off, we prayed down the western part of the state, spent the night in Fergus Falls, then into Hutchinson. The others were doing the same thing as they came into Hutchinson. Along with that, Richard also uses, he's part of the Assembly of God Church, Youth Alive Ministries. <clears throat> he works with a lot of youth pastors. He had 37 youth pastors and their youth groups going around their local areas, praying for the schools in their areas. It's basically praying for all the public high schools in the state of Minnesota, 472 of them, to stop at every one of those and pray for them the week before school starts along with every corner of the state. Just a great ministry. We did have 
making the whole tour about 26 people this, this year. Along with that, you know, it used to be a men's only ride, but part of the tour now, we've got couples riding on motorcycles. And like I said, there's a couple odd ones like me. Well, I took my Camaro, and there was a couple of young gals that had never experienced it. They wanted to experience it, so they took a car and followed me. And, you know, God uses these motorcycles, Camaros, whatever, as a tool. You can imagine in, your, in a school, three, four guys, biker dudes, come pulling up on a motorcycle, and they're stopping. Well, what are you doing? God uses that motorcycle as a tool for them to talk with people about what they're doing, that they're going out praying for this campus, the teachers, the faculty, the students. And it's a tool. Now, some people say, well, why do you do this? Because we have to pay to go on the tour. We have to pay our own gas. We have to take a week off. Now, I guess I don't have to take a week off from work, but some people do. Some people take a week of their their vacation from work to do just this. So here's a clip from some of the people from last year's tour. You can get a feel for what that was about. <clears throat> I... I suppose maybe it would have been like in the, the cowboy days. They had their horse, they had the open range, uh, they were more free. It's something like that. I like the, uh, the experience of freedom. I like the solitude. It's a different type of solitude. You, you know everything that's going on around you. You hear the noise, the smells, whether it's cold or warm, and it's unique. You get to see from the north to the south how remarkable this state is. It's beautiful, the bluffs and the cliffs and the, the water. and It just kind of reminds you again how big God really is. The Persil Tour is an opportunity for adults to really get involved with student ministry and students reaching students on their campus. The way that adults get involved is by praying for schools all around the state of Minnesota. So Prayer Zone Tour is a result of that desire to see adults be involved with prayer and praying for students by praying for every high school in the state of Minnesota, physically riding by and praying for a particular school. It, it, as much as I pray, I am overflowing with a sense of God's presence. It is an unbelievable experience. The biggest thing I think I've learned, and I have always known this since I ride uh, with these guys, and that is so often we catch ourselves saying, well, that's the least I can do. That's the least we can do is pray. But what I've learned is it's the most we can do. Any buddy can be a prayer zone partner. You don't have to ride a motorcycle. You don't have to even ride with us. You can pray from home when you drive your car by a school. When you see a school bus in your local community with students in it or empty. Just as a reminder, I can pray for students and to begin to pray for students. You don't have to do it how we do it. You just need to remember on a daily basis that I'm going to pray for my school, for my children or my grandchildren or my nieces and my nephews or my cousins or whatever relation and if you don't have anyone in schools at this point in time maybe there's even a possibility you can find out who some students names are in school and begin to pray for them but if we as adults would just say instead of putting the school to the side as a different area that we're not familiar with we would bring it front and center and just make it part of our prayer life i think god would use every one of those prayers to really change students' lives. And that's really what I'm looking for, miraculous changes that people can't explain except the hand of God is upon that school. <clears throat> that gives you just a little blurb from the ride last year. And as Chris said in there, how often have each of us said, well, that's the least I can do is pray for somebody? You know, many times. Prayer is the most powerful thing in the world. That's the most we can do for people. And you know what? It doesn't take a lot of effort on our part, does it? 
God uses this tour in many different ways. This year we had a large group that rode basically the whole tour. We had about 26 on the run. Six couples, the rest individuals. And it was different. You've seen in the, in the video there the three bikes just kind of driving through. And a lot of times you have to because you have 300 to 400 miles to go for the day. You've got 10, 12 schools that you've got to pull in. Every one of those schools has taken about 15 minutes of time off from just driving. With the added people this year, the guys on the motorcycle were able to stop, take their helmets off, and walk up and put their hands on the flagpole and pray. That was a whole different dynamic. We heard time after time from the bikers. That was a new experience for us. We had an opportunity on the tour this year. Um, one was a group of bikers, and, and one was myself with the two gals that followed. We would got to pray at brand new schools. Hadn't been opened yet. They were just opening their doors. We got to go to the flagpoles. The one guy on a motorcycle had brought his anointing oil with, so they anointed the doorposts. They anointed the flagpole for that school and claimed that territory for God. Just a fantastic ministry. In Deuteronomy, from our lesson earlier, also in chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, it says, For what great nation has a God near to them as the Lord our God is near to us? And what great nation has decrees and regulations as righteous and fair as the body of instructions I'm giving you today? But watch out. Be careful never to forget what you have seen. Do not let these memories escape from your mind as long as you live. And be sure to pass them on to your children and grandchildren. Never forget the day when you stood before the Lord your God at Mount Sinai, where he told me, summon the people before me, and I will personally instruct them. Then they will learn to revere me as long as they live, and they will teach their children to fear me also. So how are we doing on that? How are we doing taking these lessons and commandments that, Moses, that God gave to Moses to give to the people and give to us? Proverbs 22.6 says, train up, a train up a child in the way he should go, and then when he is old, he will not depart from it. Think about that. Train up our children. We're coming to school season. We're coming to Sunday school. We need teachers in all areas to lift up our children, to chain, train our children. As a church, we get 45 minutes a week, maybe, to help lay foundations to our children, to help train them. A father and son... They were out on a walk one day, and this little child looks up. They were walking in a town and said, Dad, how does, how does all the electricity get from one pole to the other? I don't know, his father said. I, I never knew much about electricity. A few blocks later, there was loud thunder and lightning, and that too puzzled me, came the reply. The youngster in, continued to inquire about many things. Two, three-year-old, as parents, grandparents, how many times have you heard, why, why, how about, tell me this, right? And that was the whole walk. Finally, as they were nearing home, the boy said, Pop, I hope you don't mind all the questions. Not at all, replied his father. How else are you going to learn? He didn't have an answer to one of those questions, did he? Now, we don't have many children here today, but there's a verse in Ephesians. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. He's giving the command to the children. Now, he's gave the command to the parents and grandchildren, but he's also now telling the children. And if somebody the other day says, hold it, there's another verse there, and I had to look it up and find it. It's verse 4, just a couple later. It says, Parents, don't stir up anger in your children. Bring them up in training and instructions of the Lord. 
So as much as children obey your parents, parents, don't harass your kids. Don't make it too tough on them, right? Teach them to obey authority. You know, we live in a culture today that tends to reject authority. We see it on the news every day. We chaff against what we're being told to do, that the rules. We don't trust people that are in charge, do we? We don't believe our senators, our representatives. We don't trust our police. And it's too bad we're getting to the point we don't trust our pastors and priests anymore. We challenge our teachers. And children quickly learn they don't have to listen to their parents because society is that way. Now, we're not only supposed to teach our children, but we also have the responsibility to protect them. The early Native Americans had quite a ritual. For when a young boy reached his age of 13, he was to transition from boyhood to manhood. He had learned about hunting, scouting, all his fishing skills. The, the tribe had taught him. The elders had taught him. But he was to be put to one final test. He was placed in the middle of a dense forest, and he had to spend the entire night alone. Until then, he had never been away from the security of having his dad, his grandpa, somebody with him, watching over him. But that night, He's blindfolded, and he's taken several miles away. When he took off his blindfold in the middle of the night, in the middle of the thick woods, he was terrified. Every little twig, every little sound, he visualized an animal or something coming to get him. After what seemed like an eternity, dawn breaks, and the first ray of sunlight enters in. Looking around, the boy saw the flowers, the trees, and the outline of the path that he came in on. Then to his amazement and astonishment, there was a figure of a man standing beside him just a few feet away. And that person was armed. It was his father. His father had been there all night long, even though he didn't know it. Think about that in your life. How many times has your Heavenly Father been next to you? All the time and you didn't know it. He's there all the time. It's just a prayer away. But do we use that power of prayer? And we're supposed to protect our children just like that Indian father did. He stood there watching over his children. We're supposed to protect them from the influence that wage wars for their souls. And there is... A ton of war going on out there for our kids. We have to instill those values. We have to instill those instructions that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. We have to make sure that foundation is there because sometime they may wander off from it. And later in life, it needs to be there. That foundation needs to be strong for them to come back to. Society today has kind of forgotten about those values that God's given us. It kind of makes us uh, get our conscience turned up at times when we violate those values. We don't want to have that conscience. We don't want that person sitting on our shoulders saying, hey, that's not right. We just want to do what we want. Too many people. Too many kids are growing up today without knowing God, without knowing that salvation that God can bring them. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. How did they know that 2,200, 2,300 years ago? They'll follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They'll reject the truths and go after myths. If somebody ever tells you the Bible's not true, there's a verse that comes true today, thousands of years ago. Now, as parents, we don't like to think of our children as being lost. We don't like to think of our neighbor's children being lost either. Do you know the problem today it may not be the children that are lost. It may be the parents that are lost. 
We're prone to think in terms of somebody else's children being lost. Never mind. My kid would never do that. They're a little angel, right? But you know the truth, the truth that we have to face is that any children of the age of understanding that don't know Christ, they are lost. And we as a society, parents, grandparents, have failed to hold up those commands that God gave us to train up our children. You know, if there was a kid lost here in Rosa, if the parents called the police and said, my son or daughter is lost, I would guess the whole community would get activated. They'd be called out to search. And we'd search until that one lost child was found. Just like that shepherd that went out for sheep number 100. The 99 were in the pen, but I need that one last one. The community would be there. Yet you know what's terrible? Is there so many children growing up today? They don't have that community behind them. They don't have the adults. They don't have somebody to bring them to God to talk about the new birth that Jesus Christ can bring. Again in Timothy chapter 3 it says, But you must remain faithful to the things you've been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they've been given wisdom to receive the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. Many children throughout our state are lost. There's many children right here in Rosa that are lost. They don't have anyone to teach them that. They don't have anyone to bring them that message of hope. They don't have anyone that wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, have a great day and God loves you. They don't hear that. One of the things as we're out on prayer zone. And stopping at these schools, not only praying for the kids, the teachers, the administration, and everything going on in that school, is we pray for open doors. Part of Richard Baker's ministry that he does most of the time with Youth Alive is he works on bringing um, assembly programs into campuses, into schools. Now, they can't be Christian. They're secular programs. But they're all based on Christian values. And they bring into these schools a message of a hope. And then in the evening, they get together with the churches of the area and they put on a Christian-based program for the kids to come out. Richard gave us some numbers. I didn't write them down, but I'll try to remember a few of them. They've been into schools now where they've gotten in front of just under 400,000 of our students. And with their evening programs... They've had 96,000 kids attend those evening programs over the years. And of those 96,000 students, 26,000 have answered the call those evenings to give their heart to God. It makes a difference. Children are important. So we pray for that. We pray that these schools will be open, that they'll be open to allow that message of hope to come in. Jesus said, bring the children to him, right? Mark 10. Then they brought the little children to him, and he, his might touched them. But the re- disciples, they rebuked them, those who brought him. Then Jesus saw it. He was greatly displeased and said to him, let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid hands on them, and blessed them. We're supposed to bring our children to God. Now, the problem we have is sometimes we need to bring God to them. So let me run a video of what those assembly programs look like. Youth Alive is about reaching students on every campus and every community, and this helps me reach students all across the state of Minnesota. So 
four years ago, uh, I had the opportunity of having Youth Alive in Worthington and the surrounding areas with the Seven Project um, to do school assemblies and to have an evening outreach. And it was an amazing opportunity to see God move upon the hearts and lives of students and people in the community. It was just a home run. Well, when I hit, when I heard the message, it really hit me. So I decided to take that seriously. And so I started going to church more. I started going to youth group. It was a really big pivotal moment because nobody in my family goes to church or anything like that. And they still don't. And I'm still trying to get through them and I know that I will. But being the first one in my family to go to church and everything to even experience Christ, that's a big pivoting point because now I have to be the rock to help them get into Christ and everything and along with all my friends and everything too. Four years ago, we came to Worthington, Minnesota to do a seven project outreach. Sebastian came to the outreach that night and gave his life to Jesus Christ. Now, four years later, we're back again and he was there to pray with students this time instead of being prayed for and leading them to Jesus Christ. It's just an awesome feeling to witness someone experience Christ for the first time. It's been an awesome week seeing God move and seeing hundreds of people come to know him and thousands of people giving a message of hope and uh, do it again as soon as I can. That's what Youth Alive is all about. Students come to Christ, students follow Christ, students are discipled in their faith, and students begin to reach out to other students. We want to reach every student on every campus in every community. That's what Speed the Light helps us do. Thank you students all across the nation for helping us do that. Last year, Richard got a call from a superintendent of one of the multi-campus schools down by Minneapolis and said, I've heard about your program. Could you please come in here and put this on in our school? And they're not cheap. For him to bring in his whole staff, bands, all of that's about $7,000 an event. But he came in there, and they set up. And the auditorium's just full. He said there's a couple thousand kids sitting there, the teachers, everybody's there. And the superintendent walks out and thanks everyone for coming and says, you know what, you're going to be here for a number of hours, hundreds of hours over the next months in this school year. But this next hour will be the most important hour in your whole school year. Pay attention to it. It's one thing Prayer Zone has done. Through the power of prayer of many people, we've been able to pray and doors have opened up in schools that Richard has never been able to get into. Number of stories over the years that Richard's done this where kids weren't going to go to school this one day. In fact, um, probably about four years ago in Carlstead, Richard had a school program that day. Young gal, 16 years old, she cleaned out her locker the night before. The next morning, she gets up, she leaves a note on her pillow, and for some reason decided to go to school, which she did every morning. She heard the program. She came to the assembly, the church assembly that night, and gave her life to Christ. And Richard got a chance to talk with her because she was off to the side crying. And he said, what's going on? What can I do? She said, I had no intention of coming to school today. I left home. I was going to kill myself. I left a note saying goodbye to my parents on my pillow this morning. This assembly and this program tonight changed my life. It's important. Children are important. They're important for us. On your way out, if you want, there's a little window cling. Peel it off, put it up in your window. As a reminder, when you're going through a school zone, pray for youth. Pray for every student, every school, every community. Take a couple, pass them out, put them in all your vehicles. Every year, Richard gives us a prayer. Sometimes we come to a school, the Holy Spirit hasn't prompted us what to pray about. There's a prayer card back there. It's from Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14. It's what a lot of times we were praying for this year for the kids. Grab one of them, pass them out.
So I challenge all of you this year, pray for our students, pray for our schools, be vigilant in it. So you know what? Children are important. We need to take the time as a church family, as parents, grandparents, we need to take the time and invest in our children's lives because they are the future. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and say, Lord, help us all to remember the commands that you've given us to teach our children, to lift them up, to help them get into your kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, Lord. We lift up our schools. As school starts here in a couple days now, we lift them up. We lift up the children, the teachers, the faculty. Lord, and we ask that each one of those that, that do believe in you and call themselves a believer, that they will be able to stand taller, that they will be a beacon to you and to others in the school, that you will help, that they will help spread your kingdom and your territory within those schools. Lord, we also ask that you be with all those people in Harvey, Texas. We lift up them. We lift up all the volunteers and the people that are working, helping others down there. Help people to see the light that you bring into their lives, the goodness and the hope that you can bring, even in the midst of something as disastrous as, as what they're going through. Lord, we know that if we believe in you, you are always by our side. You're just a prayer away. You're just standing there ready to help. We just have to reach out. And Lord, you've given us the prayer you taught your disciples. Help us all to keep that in mind as we pray. Our heavenly heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message from First United Lutheran Church.